And I'd go so far as to say that unless we rediscover the sacred, we will never avoid the downfall, the destruction of our civilization. I mean, Solzhenitsyn uh, repeatedly said that the reason such terrible things had happened in his lifetime in the society where he was in Soviet Russia was that, as he said, men have forgotten God. Hello and welcome back to Creed and Culture. It's a real joy to have Dr. Ian McGilchrist with us on the show today. Uh, Ian, how are you doing today? Very well, and uh, thank you very much, Luke, for um, arranging this this interview. Yeah, well, we really appreciate your time. Are you speaking to us from your house on the Isle of Skye? On the Isle of Skye, where we've had snow for two days, so I'm not going anywhere, which is marvellous. <laughs> 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 I've never been, I'm a huge fan of the mountains and I've never been, but I've heard the Isle of Skye is just breathtaking. So I'll have to get up sometime. I think so. Yes, yes. It sounds to me as though you're, you're from the Emerald Isle. This is true. Yep. I'm a Northern Irishman. <laughs> and, uh, Northern Irishman. Uh, yeah. I, yes, Northern Irish. Yeah, yeah. I love the, love the, uh, the mountains over there, but never been to yes, Skye. Right. No. So, no. Ian uh, has had a, has had an enormously impressive career. He was a fellow at All Souls uh, at Oxford University, where he taught literature, and then he trained in in medicine, which is, I guess, quite an unusual career step, but a, but a fascinating one. Uh, and he went on then to work as a psychiatrist for many years, and then in his writing, he's brought together this interest, as I understand it, this interest in literature um, and this interest in the mind. Perhaps his most famous book is The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World. And, he, and he's got other works out, I think two volumes of The Matter of Things in the last couple of years. So it's a real honor to have Ian on the show. He's um, had a lot to say about not only about the brain and about how we understand the world that we're based in, that a lot of religious people have engaged with, but also with what's going on in wider culture. So perhaps to mm. kick us off, uh, Ian, could you could you give us sort of a brief introduction to sort of, I guess, the main thesis, perhaps of the master and his emissary, but perhaps also sort of the main thesis of your life's work, if that would be a, a fair description mm. of it. Yes. Well, um, my very first book in my 20s was called Against Criticism, which was about the problems that I felt were endemic in the business of approaching works of art, in this case, works of literature, which was that we took something that was unique, embodied and implicit, and turned it into something that was general in nature, disembodied and explicit, and thereby destroyed the power and the meaning of it. And I, I felt there was something wrong with um, the way in which we excluded all except the most abstract kind of cognition. And uh, I, I have always been essentially interested in ideas and uh, went to, well, I was all souls, I had freedom to do what I liked. So I went to the philosophers, set the philosophers' seminars on the mind body relationship and so on. Basically, I found them too disembodied and felt I needed to do this in a more embodied way which basically meant training in medicine, uh, beginning at the grand old age of 28. And um, I did that and uh, went into ne neurology for a, a short while and to the Mortley, where I was a psychiatrist with a particular interest in neurology. So that's where we were. And the thesis of the master and his emissary uh, is, is continuous, if you like, with my earlier interests because... One day while I was there, I heard a colleague, John Cutting, talking about hemisphere differences, particularly about the role of the right hemisphere, which I'd heard very little about in medical school. Everything seemed to be reliant on the left hemisphere, which did all the heavy lifting. This turns out to be a, a terrible travesty, as I discovered, as I explored the area. But essentially, what he'd done is spent 
20, 30 years looking at and listening to um, patients with right hemisphere damage, not left hemisphere damage, and discovered that, in fact, this was more devastating than left hemisphere damage, even though with left hemisphere damage, many people lose, uh, most people lose um, their capacity to speak. And for those that are right-handed, they've lost control of their dominant arm. So quite important, but it turns out to be much harder to rehabilitate people after a right hemisphere stroke. Why is that? Well, they see the world in two different ways. And this has uh, uh, an origin that goes back really as far as we know in any animals that have um, neuronal complexes, the ancestors of brains, they're already asymmetrical. This is fascinating. And as they turn into brains, they're divided. Why? I think effectively this is because all creatures have to solve a problem, which is that of being able to get stuff to grab their prey, to pick up whatever it is they need um, to manipulate the world or just to get stuff. And this is essential to survival, but equally essential to survival is watching out for predators, looking out for your mm. kin, tending your offspring and your mate. And so you require two kinds of attention. One very narrow beam targeted on a detail that you already know you need and another quite the opposite. Um, no, not, not in any way, um, uh, given to what it will find, uh, keeping an open mind, a very broad one, a sustained vigilant attention. And this effectively leads to two kinds of world. One in which there is um, a, a lot of fragments, these little bits that we know what they are and we need them and we can get them. But it has no meaning or structure, this world. It's made just of little bits, it's fragmentary, the bits are disembodied, they're decontextualized, they're abstract, they have no individual quality, they're just members of categories, and the whole thing is inanimate, effectively, rather machine-like, importantly. And uh, the right hemisphere, meanwhile, lets us see a quite different world in which everything is interconnected and flowing. Nothing is ever completely static or completely known. It is always developing, evolving. A lot of its value and a lot of what it is communicating is implicit, cannot be put directly into, into language of the kind that we use every day at any rate. Um, and this is a much subtler kind of knowledge, which means that we understand what another person means when they say something, what they're probably thinking. Um, we understand tone of voice, humor. We understand sarcasm. The left hemisphere, meanwhile, is taking everything completely literally as if it were a computer that had been given a syntax and given a, a lexicon and was putting the meaning together. And if, in, in effect, that is one of the differences, that the left hemisphere sees bits that it must put together in order to have a map of the world, whereas the right hemisphere sees that we don't need to put things together because they're already connected deeply and they have meaning which is much greater than anything that can be in the map. So the map, the left hemisphere's map, is useful, but it doesn't contain most <laughs> of what is worth knowing about in the world. For that, we need the right hemisphere. And my contention in the master and his emissary, having unpacked the neurology and the philosophical consequences of this, was that in the modern world, we see things more and more only the way the left hemisphere would make them, as if they were mechanical, as if they could be reduced to the parts and then we'd know all about them. Um, and as if, in effect, they were a two-dimensional construct, a sort of schema of the world, not the world itself. And so I looked in the last half of the Master and His Emissary over the history of Western thought, over the history of ideas in the West, and saw that effectively three times a civilization had started very well balanced between these two points of view, each enriching the other. And this would be in early Greece, in the early foundations of Rome, and in perhaps the Renaissance in the West later. And then after a few hundred years, each of them drifted further and further towards the view of the left, hierarchical, rigid, 
um, uh, schematic, um, bureaucratic, uh, involved in grabbing power and sustaining power, but actually losing the civilization, which eventually collapsed. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> um, that's and in, the, in the, my more recent book, which is, which is the, um, the matter with things, I, I took this further by exploring how we can know that anything is true. It, it, it's a long journey, which is why it's a long book. <laughs> but um, those who've read it have written to me and responded with extraordinary enthusiasm and kindness. I've tried to show how we can discriminate between things that are more likely to be true than others. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for that summary. Um, now, I remember listening to you in an interview and you said that one of, if not the most common response you get to your work is people say, you put into words something that I've known to be true but couldn't articulate or something like that. Is that correct? Absolutely. It's one of the yeah. commonest responses. And I'd read the Master and Mystery before I saw that interview. And I, as soon as you said that, I said, that's how that's I felt. <laughs> that's how I felt. So it had, a, it had a really, I read about five years ago and had a really big influence on me in particular. So my training is in philosophy and theology. Right. Um, for the most part in the analytic tradition, I did my doctorate mm. at Oxford. And, um, and I, I think that's valuable. I think, um, yes, you know, writing clearly and, and, and logical analysis is valuable, but I'd always Absolutely. struggled to understand, um, how stories and mm. music in particular for me, uh, but for others, the visual arts, et cetera, sort of fit into that. And, and, and you mm. just, uh, articulated a, a way of understanding how, how they can complement each other and indeed how stories and music in some sense can even can be more, more profound than, than mm. uh, what we can communicate in propositions that had, had a huge effect on me. And I guess, you know, someone might be listening and say, well, I'm not on neuroscience. I don't know whether what he's saying about the brain is true. Um, but my sense is you can, I'm not a neuroscience either, but you can you can accept that general point in terms of this distinction between what we make explicit in language and that which is contained within stories and music and visual arts that we cannot put into language. There, there, there's there's a there's something there that even if you're unsure about the neuroscience, you could still grab hold of that. Uh, am I right? Yes, I think that is right. Um, on the whole, the world unfortunately divides into people who are familiar with the sciences, who love the science in my work and have no quarrel with it, but say, but then you apply it to society. I don't see how that could possibly be right. <laughs> then you get other people who love the the philosophical, historical part of the work and say, well, I don't really know about the neuroscience. I mean, perhaps I just have to not care too much and take your word for it which is fine but for me the excitement is seeing that these these ideas are rooted in the very business of our brain and in fact one of the reasons we've been aware of them is that people who've taken the trouble deeply to introspect on experience have intuited for probably thousands of years that there is some kind of a, a difference or a conflict between two ways of uh, attending to mm, the world. Mm. And um, so, uh, you know, the big revelation to me was attention makes all the difference, how you attend. If you attend mm. with a clinically detached view, looking at details to build up a picture, you see one thing. But if you look mm. at the world in a different way, which is, more holistic, if you like, then you all kinds of other things come forward. And, and one of the things mm. I've, I've noticed in my reading in the last 20, 30 years is that all over the world, in India, in China, in Japan, in the North American native people, in the, the, the writings of the in, the, or the traditions of the writings of the Inuit, in, in, in many, many traditions, what I'm talking about is encapsulated in stories, but it, mm. it's mind-bogglingly um, accurate. They've really got hold of the important distinction. Mm. And the way in which these two ways of looking at the world 
relate to one another. Because an important mm. point to put in here is that the left hemisphere is less intelligent than the right. That surprises people. Mm. Uh, they may be prepared for the fact that it is less emotionally and socially intelligent, which it undoubtedly mm. is, but it's also cognitively less intelligent. It, mm. it perceives less, it attends to less, and it's more prone to delusion. In fact, delusions and, and strange denials of reality are far, far, far commoner mm. when the person has to rely only on their left hemisphere and they have damage to the right hemisphere than when it's the other way around. So that's very important because like a lot of not very intelligent entities, the left hemisphere thinks it knows everything. Effectively, the more mm. you think you know everything, the less you probably know. And the left hemisphere knows just a few things. It's very familiar with those. It's very good at working with them. Mm. And it's a, it's a, it's a helpful servant, but it's a very poor master. Something that actually, mm. um, Einstein's, uh, is said to have said. So, um, mm. there we are. Brilliant. Yeah. Someone who actually who drew on your work is is, is a, a woman called Eleanor Stump, who's a professor mm. in, in America. And she wrote a book actually on suffering, but she started off by distinguishing between what she called uh, Dominican knowledge and Franciscan knowledge. And uh, <laughs> Dominican knowledge is obviously going to be associated with Thomas Aquinas, who was a Dominican. And it's of this that sort of left brain propositional sort. We're talking about arguments logic ex what we can make explicit whereas uh, franciscan knowledge is 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 more about uh what's Im implicit that that we mm. can uh, intuit etc etc i thought that was quite a helpful mm. maybe for our viewers and listeners as a distinction between uh, sort of aquinas the logician and saint francis the the poet yes is, is sort of one yes. way of thinking about this so yes, someone yes. um as someone trained as a theologian, obviously a big guy that we have is, is C.S. Lewis. Mm. And, you know, when I reflect on your work, I think to some extent C.S. Lewis, um, although he obviously didn't read the book, he's, he's caught what you're saying because uh, on the one hand, you have a work like Mere Christianity, which outlines a lot of the doctrines of the Christian church. And and there is a beauty to it. So he pays attention not just to the content, but to form as well. He writes well. But on the other hand, he writes the Narnia Chronicles. So he appreciates mm. stories. And I think part of the reason that C.S. Lewis was the, the phenomenon that he was is because he combined both. Um, Absolutely. And arguably, in fact, Jordan Peterson is is doing the same because Jordan has the scientific yeah. background uh, he's yes. got um, the sort of philosophical background, but there's also the sort of deep religious and uh, attention to stories. His that that first yes. book of his, Maps yes. of Meaning, yes. was all about myths. And again, part yes. partly, I wonder whether that's why Jordan is so popular. So, do you think figures like um, Lewis and, and and if you like uh, Jordan as well are on to something there? And are they are mm -hmm. they exemplifying what you're after or or is lewis not going far enough in the sense that he still places um quite a lot of confidence in language when he's when he's writing his you know, christianity etc yes i need to sort of um qualify the understanding of what it is i'm saying um i'm a great fan of clarity um, I'm a great fan of using language carefully. <laughs> and one of the things that people often comment on is how clearly I write about very difficult things and how much pain I take to help people understand what I'm saying. So I'm a believer in clarity as far as clarity can go, but no further than that. Mm, and okay. um, so... And I'm also, you know, language is my, is my medium. Um, it's what I write in, what I think in, what I talk in. Um, I'm not a painter. I'm not a composer. Alas, I've written occasional poems. But poetry is the way in which we use language in a way to subvert the weaknesses of language. We, <laughs> it, it, it goes beyond. Mm. The reason it's not prose is that it is evoking all sorts of things 
subtly many things at the same time that ramify, that are implicit, and co- uh, creating a much richer kind of way of thinking than just a, a word equals a thought and just putting them together like we're building Lego. So um, what myths and fables and uh, the great narratives, and I think the Narnia books is is an example of a, of a great, or are a great example of, of a good narrative. I remember reading it to my children and they were absolutely riveted by the story. Mm -hmm. And as I was reading it, I was thinking such profound theology. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, no, I'm a great believer in in logic and reason and I'm a scientist. So I, I value these things. In fact, if anything, I believe nowadays we undervalue reason and science. I think reason is under attack from people who would want us to believe a lot of things that I think are extremely um, hard to defend. And uh, science is under attack now even for, mm. um, you know, not being politically correct or something like this. Mm. Now, I, I, I'm sorry, I think that is not a path I would want to go down. I think science is a very valuable touchstone. And if we jettison it, where are we? What are we left with? Science is not a modern invention. Science has been something that has been done in all civilizations since the very start. The very earliest mm. Greeks were, amongst other things, they were poets and playwrights and philosophers, but they were also scientists. So science is, I, you know, I hold the candle for science and for reason. But I just, what I dislike is the idea that science and reason can tell us everything, because mm. they simply yeah. can't. There are plenty of things that are beyond either science or reason or language. And that's why we have things like poetry and stories and music mm. and so on, which take us to a realm beyond the immediate understanding of a, of a piece of prose. Yes, I'm completely on board uh, with that. I guess when I was reading your book, when I was reading the section on Heidegger, I was reading it and because that, that goes I, I, almost a step further because we have, I'm on board with, form matters as whether as well as content in other words how you write and speak matters as as as, as much as as what you write and speak and i'm on board with <coughs> the value of stories and visual art and music and you know I, I think i'm persuaded that they're they're probably more valuable than the sort of uh academic work i do but then heidegger goes a step further for our viewers and listeners who aren't aware heidegger was a uh, a German uh, philosopher, and he wrote in a manner that many find very difficult to understand. And when I was reading it, I was like, "Do I need to become Heidegger? <laughs> is is that to what extent is um, are you urging us to? I guess to go that far to move to the to the point where what we write." Um, is really, some would say, impenetrable, unless, I guess, you do a PhD in it or something. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I don't think we need, all need to become Heidegger, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, my admiration for Heidegger is high, but knows bounds as well. One of the things people have said to me uh, now and again after reading The Master and His Emissary is, Thank you for what you have to say about Heidegger. I'd never really understood Heidegger, but after Mm. reading what you've got to say, I see what it is that he was getting at. Um, Mm. I may have therefore completely misunderstood Heidegger (laughs) in making him comprehensible, but I don't think so. Um, Mm. I I think he's on record as saying he deliberately obfuscated. And, Mm. And his reasoning was that if you make everything too clear, people don't Mm. really get the full experience of it. It's Mm. the analogy I think of is like if you've been driven a route by car a number of times, you know it in a sort of way, but when you've had to drive it yourself, then you know it in a different way. You really know Mm. it. And Mm. I think what he's getting at is that there is a kind of glib way in which one can make deep things seem easy to grasp and in the process lose something. In in my Mm. view, Lewis is so beautifully clear in his writing. I, I, I have such admiration for him for many, many reasons. But one is the, the beautiful clarity with which he writes. But I think one of the reasons that he's 
um, not um, thought of with the same kind of academic respect is that he, well, A, he wrote children's books, um, but B, that he is so very clear. He, he writes about things that are quite subtle, and when you read them, you go, well, that's obvious. <laughs> And so, in a way, he's he's taken away um, the difficulty of getting there. So you just mm. think, hmm, see what I mean? So, mm. anyway, Heidegger aside, I think the phenomenological philosophers are deeply important. So for me, mm. um, to an extent Husserl, to an extent Heidegger, to a greater extent Merleau-Ponty, and to an even greater extent Scheler, Max Scheler, mm. uh, have been very, very important in my mm. uh, intellectual development. And interesting, yeah. these were people who were not much spoken about in Oxford. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. I was um, I was actually speaking to a mutual friend of ours last night, James Orr, who's been on Cretan Culture, and he's he's doing a bit of work on that, on the phenomenologists at the moment. So I'll have to read his book when it comes out. But thank you for those thoughts. Now, I'm aware... My girlfriend tells me, look, you know, try not to make your questions too nerdy. So I, I realized I was pretty nerdy last time. So we're going to draw back. Okay, I'm going to become <laughs> much less nerdy. And we're going to talk about, uh, as a final section, about an interview you gave about a year and a half ago to David Fuller from Rebel, Rebel Wisdom. Uh, because we've been considering sort of the underlying, um, your underlying thesis. Um, but we want to think now a bit about society. So in this interview, you communicated that you think society is heading in a, in a bad direction. You've already hinted mm. at that when you spoke about the sciences and the attack on the sciences has been politically incorrect. Um, I think you had in mind council culture, that sort of thing. And I think you suggested we need to wake up and, and do something about that. So what are the what are these causes, I guess, briefly again, what are the causes for decline you see in wider society? And what have you noticed since that interview a year and a half ago? Are there any causes for hope or are you pessimistic? Yes. I mean, I don't claim at any point that um, knowing about the way the brain works gives us a cause for, for things. The brain doesn't direct uh, our civilization, our culture, or anything of the kind. It's responsive to that culture and civilization, which will change it in some ways. And this, of course, changes um, the culture in turn. But it's a, it's a sort of an encounter, a synergy, a, a kind of a, 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 not, not a one way directional causation. So, in the situation we're in now, there should be many causes, and there are um, geopolitical, economic, um, uh, uh, many kinds mm -hmm. of causation that a historian would point to. But what I'm pointing to is that there is one overarching way of looking at it which helps to draw things together and explain why this is not going to work. <laughs> and and that is where hemisphere theory can can help us understand what we're experiencing. So I think what we're we're, we're going through is is something that's been dubbed the meta crisis, which is to say it's not just a crisis in that we're destroying the natural world, not just that we're extinguishing species, not just that we are driving to extinction indigenous peoples and their ways of life, not just that there is an epidemic of um, a, 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 of depression, of, of ill health of all kinds, not just that there is fragmentation of society uh, and people at one another's throats. Um, what is happening is a polarization, a simplification, um, a desire for black and white categories, um, a, a, a disembodiment of the way we think, a refusal of empathy, of, uh, of tolerance and kindness in the way in which we talk to one another. There's um, a fixation on greed, on, on what can be got either by um, a corporation, a government, uh, or by an individual, but generally this is the 
this is the outcome of listening to the world as conceived by the left hemisphere, where it is simply a lump of stuff. And there is stuff there that is useful to us. And it's that that we need to get hold of. And from an evolutionary point of view, the left hemisphere has evolved to get stuff. <laughs> it's the hemisphere of manipulation. Mm. And mm. this is why civilizations destroy themselves. They overreach themselves. They get more and more. They want more and more power. They want more and more resource. They want more and more control. And it's this lust for control rather than um, nourishing a kind of intelligent freedom. It's this lust for power rather than um, uh, 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 the flourishing of creativity that is dragging us down to a place where we become more and more machine-like. There's a terrific imposition of the idea of the machine and the fact of the machine in life since I wrote The Master and His Emissary. Some people say the last chapter of that book in which I looked at what might happen if the left hemisphere mm. took over was prescient because that's exactly mm. what has happened. Um, to be honest, I was describing the world as I saw it then, so it wasn't that prescient. Mm. But, um, but in any case, this is the way in which things are drifting. And the point here is that it's, while it's necessary to have piecemeal solutions to piecemeal problems, that will never do in the long run because it's only with a change in the way we think about ourselves and the world and how the two of us relate that will bring about healing. Unless we achieve that, we'll just carry on being the same uh, anxious, narcissistic, unfulfilled, um, greedy, resentful, entitled people that we are. Instead, we should practice a way of being which has more modesty, more um, realism in a way about what we can know and what we can do, um, a greater sense of empathy and, and, and compassion for one another, and a greater sense of wonderment and awe at the world, not feeling, oh, we understand it all. Um, it's just a machine. We can do what we like with it. I mean, this is wrong on so many counts, mm. um, and, and it's the way we think now. So that's really what I'm saying, is that if you really want to understand what's happened, it's not just that we we were doing fine. You know, everything was going well, and then suddenly somebody pointed out that the weather was changing. And somebody said, you know, species are going extinct. And somebody else said, why are there such rabid wars going on in society between groups that used to get on rather well together? You know, when I was growing up, men and women weren't at one another's throats, the races weren't mm. at one another's throats, but now they are. Is this an improvement? Mm. Is it better now that we're much, much unhappier than we were 30, 40 years ago? Mm. I mean, we've got the data on this. We know that it's not a, it's not an artifact of diagnosis. We've got records of the way people reported their lives and mm. th their answers to questionnaires going back, um, well, nearly a hundred years. And we know that people have got s systematically more unhappy, more unsettled. Um, and more directionless. So it's that that we're losing and that that we're missing. So, I mean, that, there's so much there. To, to really make it practical, you, you give two examples there, sort of men and women are at each other's throats and, and the races are at each other's throats. Take the gender issue. So what what is going wrong, particularly with with, with the gender issue, the mistrust between the sexes? And how practically might that might that be attended to? Well, it's too big a question, really, for me to yeah, give a okay, clear answer. Enough. Yeah. Um, all I can say is that a little more finesse in our understanding of things, a little less sense of self righteousness on both sides and an acknowledgement that men and women have different strengths. Um, I'm not denying to anybody of either sex um, the right to do and the ability to do um, many, many things. I, I, I don't misunderstand me, but, you know, 
there are things that just make us unhappy if we deny them, I think. And, uh, and men are asked in a way to be, deny their masculinity and women to deny their femininity. Both of these are seen as somehow um, relics of an old-fashioned way of thinking, but I, I, I'm not so sure is all I'd say. And just so just finally, so I can make the link for our viewers and listeners, so to mm. take that practical example, and I realize that's obviously an enormous question. In, but then enormous can we, question. Can we, I, I know exactly you could write another volume of matters, matter of things on it, the gender volume. But uh, <laughs> I will so, never write. <laughs> <laughs> so then how can we bring together your thesis about these the right versus left, these different ways of, of attending to the world, explicit versus implicit, is there a way to link that into this very practical example of the sort of the war of the sexes? Well, I'd be loath to 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 try and fit it to that. Mm. Um, I mean, in a way, it's just something I I said because it's undeniably a matter of observation for somebody who, who's in their seventies. Uh, mm. The happiest couples I know. Uh, of a generation that are now dying out. They had relatively mm. long marriages. They learned to fit with one another and tolerate one another and love one another. And the, mm. the, the happiest and kindest and most generous relationships between men and women that I know are amongst people who are now dying out. And, I, you know, yeah. there we are. I mean, it's, all, it, it, it's just a matter of observation. I'm not saying yeah. right or wrong here. And maybe yeah, it's inevitable yeah, sure. that we all have to, you know, vie with one another and compete with one another and hate one another for being <laughs> who we are. But I, I, I doubt the wisdom of it completely. Hmm. Okay. Well, let, let me then, let me just go at it a slightly different way and say, okay, w what, what can the takeaway be? There's all this um, chaos in wider society. Um, I'm in agreement with, with you on a lot of that. Uh, so what, if, if, because I don't want to, I, I know you're careful to talk about causality, but what could the takeaway, because one takeaway could be something like this. We need to see um, the whole as well as the parts. We need to pay more attention to these right hemisphere ways of attending to the world. We need to re-enchant the world. We need yes, to rediscover that. sort of the religious um, element of life through yes, attending yes. to stories and the great music and the great visual art of the West. And it, as, as we do that, that will help fill out the, the picture. I mean, is that is it is that the sort of thing? I, you're I think that's. After? I, I I wouldn't disagree with that at all. Uh, I think that's exactly right. And I'd go so far as to say that unless we rediscover the sacred, we will never avoid the downfall, the destruction of our civilization. Hmm. I mean, Solzhenitsyn uh, yeah. repeatedly said that the reason such terrible things had happened in his lifetime in the society where he was in Soviet Russia was that as he said, men have forgotten God. And mm. um, for many people, that word God is, is a problem. That's why I mm. um, was very careful in talking about the sacred in the final chapter of The Matter of Things, a very long, I mean, it's a book-length chapter mm. on how to understand the divine mm. and the sacred and to try and explain to people that it doesn't mean believing in an old man sitting on a cloud and embracing mm -hmm. um, six impossible things before breakfast, but it's more about a wise disposition of oneself towards a cosmos that is rich and complex beyond our full comprehension. And that seems to um, point to certain elements that we would otherwise ignore. It seems to have a a purpose. I mean, these are all huge questions that require seminars over a week, not mm. five minutes. That's the difficulty. Yeah, but yeah. but I, I do think that that is very, very important. And I, I sympathize entirely with people who say, oh, that's all rubbish. It's, all, it's terrible old, old stuff. I, I, I can't bear people talking about God and things like that. I, look, I, I, I understand that. And I, 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 
I, I, I take that into account in, in the way I write about it, but I hope uh, that from what people say, I have succeeded in helping people see that there is something very important there, that it's mm-hmm. about a whole vision of humanity and the cosmos. It's, mm-hmm. it's not about we must do more of this. I mean, I can say things about educational policy. I can say things mm-hmm. about the natural world and what we need to protect it. I, you know, all of that is, is in a way clear. It's clear what we need to do. It's less clear exactly how to achieve it. But, um, but that's in a way doing what the left hemisphere wants, which is to come back mm. to uh, something that I can have on my agenda. So I need to do this and this yes. and this, and then everything will be fine. Well, no, everything won't be fine <laughs> unless we fundamentally have a change in here. But the good mm. news is that we can begin it by changing the bit we know about, which is what goes on in here. You know, people mm. always say, but I'm so small, the world's so big, and the yeah. world is so small in relation to the cosmos. Well, this is the left hemisphere thinking that, importance is measurable but it isn't you are very important and there are things you can do that only you can do that can change the way in which you understand the world and that will change the world if you get enough Mm. people to change the way they think feel and see the world that will produce the change in perhaps not so long that is required Mm. as well as having I understand the necessity of the practical tasks, as people would call them. But there's nothing mm. impractical about changing your your heart and mind. In fact, it's mm. necessary for our salvation and for your happiness and fulfillment as a human being. Mm. It's interesting on that point. Uh, did you come across Ayan Hirsi Ali's recent announcement about her conversion? I heard about it, actually. It just probably yesterday or the day before. Mm. Tell me more. Well, it's fascinating because for our viewers and listeners, Ian Hersey Ali wrote, uh, what was the name of the book? I, I can't remember the name of the book, but basically it was a book about uh, her experience in uh, a fundament, fundamentalist uh, Islamic uh, society and oh, how right. she got free from that. So she got free from that and she came to Amsterdam and then eventually Mm. to the United States. And she was one of the new atheists. So she was friends Mm. with Richard Dawkins for, I I think, a a decade or two, uh, rejected uh, Islam, rejected Mm. fundamentalism, embraced the new atheism, science, reason. But a month or two ago, she announced that actually she's now converted to Christianity. And Mm -hmm. she gave various reasons for this. But one of the reasons was that she sees the threats to the West being um, this sort of woke revolution, which I guess is, is the West arguably eating itself from within, and also mm. the, the threat from um, from Islam as well. And she thinks the only thing that can equip us to deal with those threats is a is a is the Christian vision. Mm-hmm. She thinks that mm-hmm. that atheism itself is is too reductionistic. Now, some people criticized mm. her and say, and say, well, that's, that's not why you should become a Christian. Um, and, and I mm. think those criticisms were actually too harsh. There is more to it for her, but basically mm. Mm. she seemed to be saying that we need a, we need a bigger and more expansive vision. And we find yes. that in, in the Christian faith. I think that's right. I mean, to, to me, I don't know other faiths as, faiths as well, although uh, you can't really call it a faith, but I, I'm, I'm certainly a Taoist. I think that it's also compatible with Christianity to be a Buddhist. Um, in fact, there's a book called The Tao of Christ, which is a very interesting book. It shows mm. the parallels between these things. Mm. But I, 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 in my experience, the mythos, and I use that word without any implication of whether it be true or false, but the mythos of Christianity is to me, the richest one that I know in the world. Mm. Um, it's endless in its profundity and in what it gives rise to. And uh, not always good, of course, heaven knows. Anything that involves mm. such frail creatures as human beings will be interpreted. Beings, yeah. Yes, will be interpreted and used by some for ends that are contrary, really, to the spirit of Christianity. But 
You know, there are always the left hemisphere types in a religion who want laws, rules, procedures. And I'm right and you're wrong. And it's all written in the book here. And if it says so, that's it. Well, that is mm. absolutely typical left hemisphere. And it's the fundamentalism mm. that means mm. that fundamentalist atheists and fundamentalist religious yes. people, be they yeah. Islamic or Christian, um, are, you know, you can hardly get a, a razor blade between them. They've got the same mm. problem with their thinking, <laughs> as yes. far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Well, Ian, I don't want to take up any more of your time, but but what uh, an absolute uh, privilege to have you on the show. Um, I say you, you. Your, your book contributed a lot to my own thinking and, and to my continued thinking about these cultural issues, but just about deeper life issues, indeed uh, religious issues as, uh, as well. And, and you know, if you, to almost to, to back up what you're saying a bit, even the person of Christ himself talks in stories. He talks in stories mm-hmm. and he and he gives sermons, stories and sermons, mm-hmm. and uh, and he apparently knew a thing or two. So thank you so much for your time, <laughs> and um, t- yeah, to yeah. our uh, viewers and, no. and and listeners, we'll be back in a week or two. But uh, thank you, Ian. Thanks, it's a pleasure, Luke. Thank you very much. <laughs>